Alright, hello everyone, my name is Shreepi Matedi, and today we will be breaking the cycle of substance abuse, a global health crisis. So, I want to preface this discussion by saying that substance abuse is not just a statistic. It is a real-life challenge that does disrupt communities, impacts futures, and has a real effect on individuals. So today, I hope you will join me in examining the true health risks of substance abuse, understanding some of the health impacts and consequences, as well as envisioning a future against it. So, a little bit about me. My name again is Shreya Matidi, and I'm a sophomore at James Logan High School in Union City, California. Um, talking about some of my personal pursuits and extracurricular activities, I am in some capacity as a cancer researcher. In fact, I recently collaborated with the Harvard University faculty member on a meta-analysis of the mTOR complexes um, with further focused placements and locations in lung cancer. I'm also a mental health advocate as well as lead presenter here at the New Public Health Forum, as well as an active hospital volunteer and student volunteer photographer. So a brief overview of today's discussion, we're going to start off talking about the prevalence of substance abuse, focusing on vaping and cannabis consumption trends, um, then we're going to move into discussion of polydrug use, as well as talking about some of the factors that might contribute to substance abuse in adolescents, such as peer pressure and influence. From there, we'll move on to discussion about the health impacts and consequences, focusing primarily on the physical and mental well-being impacts, as well as neural development. We're going to start to wrap up with a discussion on the way forward, really a future against substance abuse. So talking about public awareness campaigns, policy and regulation strategies, as well as youth empowerment. And then we'll end with a short Q&A session, as well as some acknowledgments. So with that out of the way, let's begin the presentation. So talking about substance abuse, it really is a pressing global issue that knows no borders. In fact, according to the UNODC, the UN Office on Crime and Drug, um, use of nearly 284 million people around the world aged 15 to 64 um, used drugs really in 2020, which is nearly a 26% increase from the previous decade. And interestingly enough, it, it, we can really say that substance abuse is a gendered health concern um, because there have been a higher rate of substance use disorders, here I refer to as SUDs, um, among men. However, rates by gender are pretty much age dependent. In fact, women are more susceptible to craving and relapse, which are key phases of the addiction cycle in their mid-30s. And the U.S., interestingly enough, is actually home to one of the highest rates of substance use disorder worldwide, with alcohol being one of the most commonly misused substances as shown on the map. So what exactly is substance abuse? And for that matter, what are substance use disorders? So the APA, the American Psychological Association, defines substance abuse as a pattern of compulsive behaviors regarding really any substance, such as alcohol, tobacco products, drugs, inhalants, so these can be both legal and illicit products. So substance abuse significantly increases the chance of developing some serious health concerns, such as weakened immune systems, lung disease, um, seizures, stroke, and even brain damage for that matter. Substance use disorders are actually caused by factors such as genetic vulnerability, as well as environmental and social pressures, like peer pressure, which we'll get into a little bit later in this discussion, um, as well as just psychiatric, psychiatric problems in general. Um, substance use disorders are actually, interestingly enough, categorized by a continual drug use, oftentimes despite awareness of these physical and psychological problems that are affecting individuals. So talking about one of the biggest types of substance abuse among adolescents, we see vaping. So in the United States alone, the prevalence of vaping really is quite alarming. Um, the ASH actually reported that in 2023, nearly 20.5% of children aged between 11 and 15 have actually tried vaping. And further studies from the New England Journal of Medicine have reported nearly a 10% increase in adolescents using e-cigarettes just between 2017 and 2018, almost five years ago. And that's nearly 1.3 million teenagers. And since 2014, e-cigarettes have actually surpassed traditional tobacco products in popularity among adolescents. Cannabis is also one of the most widely consumed uh, drugs among adolescents. Nearly 2.5 million US teens, or one in basically every 10, are cannabis users. More than 600,000 teens actually meet the criteria for cannabis addiction for adults. And the past year smoking of marijuana, while it has remained relatively steady, following a large increase in 2018 to 2019, nearly 8% of 8th graders, 19% of 10th graders, and 22% of 12th graders still are active cannabis users. So now I want to switch to a topic called polydrug use, which we see in the general population really becoming quite popular. So polydrug use is basically a term that's used to describe consumption of more than one drug at the same time, or even after one another. 
And this can involve, again, both illicit and illegal substances, such as alcohol and even some forms of nicotine. So taking multiple drugs of the same class, so taking two, um, taking two stimulants, for example, can increase the impact, obviously, on the brain, and thus um, increasing the chance of overdose. So combining some stimulants, for example, can lead to psychosis, can lead to anxiety and even panic attacks, and also increases the chance of an individual experiencing serotonin syndrome. So effects become even more complicated to predict if different classes of drugs are taken. Taking a stimulant and a depressant, for example, can have lethal effects on the human body. And in a recent study actually conducted in Australia, of respondents aged 15 to 17, nearly 20% had reported using at least one substance over the past 30 days, with roughly 10% having actually admitted to polydrug use. So, in talking about peer in the woods and peer pressure, these are two of the factors that really do contribute the most to adolescent substance abuse. As many of us can probably relate to, peers do play a very important part in an individual's life, especially in late childhood and even in adolescence, when an individual is trying to form their own identity, become more independent, and also gain acceptance in society. So peer pressure interacts with a variety of other factors, including family pressure and family support systems, um, and that really is what shapes an, individual life, an individual's life and also contributes to behaviors such as substance abuse. So environmental norms are one of the most popular forms, and environmental norms are essentially when an individual feels pressured to conform to the norms of their social group. And this can also be in the form of direct pressure, which is when an individual's peer group is quite initially urging them to participate in a certain activity, and also through indirect pressure. Generally, when adolescents can see um, or overhear some of their friends or individuals in their age group participating in a certain activity, that might indirectly drive them also to participate in it. So, interestingly enough, studies have actually shown that among college students who perceived excessive drinking to be a popular activity among their peers, they were more likely to engage in heavy drinking sessions regardless of the actual reality. And interestingly enough as well, all boys and girls actually experience peer pressure um, much in the same capacity. Friends delinquent behavior is actually shown to influence girls more than boys, with girls also selecting their friends based on share smoking status more likely. So switching to discussion of some of the health impacts and consequences of substance abuse. Um, of course, different drugs do pose different dangers. However, we can generally say that drug use leads to dependence and addiction, as well as injury, um, health problems, as well as sleep issues, and so many more. Cocaine, which is linked to nearly one in every five overdose deaths, actually increases the risk of bowel damage and even increases the chance of HIV contraction. Prescription and illicit opioids um, are also top causes of overdose death, and they include a variety of different health effects, such as heart and kidney, um, even liver disease, um, coma, brain damage, and a whole slew of other issues. Um, in fact, the sharing of these unsterile, unsterile drug infection um, injection equipment, um, especially with what we see with prescription and illicit uh, opioids, can actually place substance abuse in youth at risk of HIV AIDS. Um, for those of you who know a little bit about it, you'll know that with HIV AIDS, sometimes symptoms can show a few years after, which is why many healthcare professionals actually hypothesize that young adults who have been shown to contract HIV likely came in contact with it as adolescents themselves. So further health risks of um, substance abuse includes heart muscle weakness and failure, ulcers, pancreatic inflammation, painful nerves from the constant numbing of the extremities, um, vitamin deficiencies, as well as liver damage. So something that might not be discussed as much is the mental well-being and mental health effects of these substance abuse uh, disorders. So teenagers are often drawn to substance use to alleviate unwanted mental health struggles, generally revolving around depression, anxiety, irritability, and just negative thoughts and hopelessness. However, in the long term, these symptoms can actually be exacerbated by the dependence of addiction that's caused with the substance abuse. In a 2016 study um, conducted by the Child Mind Institute found that of the 10,000 adolescents they had surveyed who had developed some sort of alcohol use or substance abuse disorder, nearly two-thirds of them actually had one or more mental health disorders. Now, while adolescents believe that consumption of alcohol, for example, or even marijuana might suppress anxiety and depression, and they see their friends do it, which is why it's not as stigmatized you know, per se as taking a prescribed medication. And while this might, they might believe it to be true, it actually can cause more energetic behaviors that leading them to engage in more risky behavior and even become more aggressive. Now you're probably wondering why that is, and that largely is because of the undeveloped brain that the adolescents have. Remember, your brain is still developing, so the pathways between regions are also still developing, and that plasticity means that the brain can more easily habituate or just really 
feels more strongly the effects of many of these drugs and uh, various substances. So, um, binge drinking and substance abuse can actually cause lasting brain damage in adolescents from delayed neuronal uh, maturation um, to even memory loss. So, damage to the prefrontal cortex and even to the hippocampus for that matter um, can place youth at risk of mental health problems such as depression, um, conduct issues, personality disorders, and even suicidal thoughts, thus ultimately leading to suicide. Um, marijuana actually has been shown to interfere with short-term memory, learning, and as well as uh, psychomotor, psychomotor issues. So, wrapping up, we talk about a way forward in a world without substance abuse. And really, what's key to that is to remember that there is no safe level of substance abuse. Despite all-time highs of substance abuse, not only among the general population, but also among adolescents, there's actually a decline in availability of substance abuse treatment facilities. So we do need stricter laws and regulations, of course, to counter the tobacco and e-cigarette industries, advertising practices and false campaigns. But really, and what's the goal of this public health forum, is to raise awareness about the hazards of the substance abuse, which is crucial for protecting individuals, including fetuses, children, and family members from its harmful effects. So recently, we've seen an implementation of drug-free community support programs, or DFCs, which basically mobilizes communities to prevent um, youth drug use. And in fact, uh, DFCs allow multiple sections of the community to address their own specific local drug problems. And we've also seen SAAPs, so Substance Abuse Awareness Programs, which can contribute to youth empowerment, and they assist schools essentially to raise awareness of drug and substance abuse among their students, thus lowering um, adolescent substance abuse. So with that, we'll just have a short Q&A session. Questions. All right. So, with that, just some quick acknowledgments. Again, thank you so much to Mr. Q, the New York Library, and the Youth Public Health Forum for giving me the chance to present my work. Of course, my parents for continuing to support me in everything I choose to pursue, and all the forum's previous speakers for their informative presentations. Of course, this presentation would not have been possible without the work of countless researchers who conduct surveys related to substance abuse, the physicians who are treating individuals suffering um, from the health impacts and consequences, as well as the public health officials who are working to raise awareness of substance abuse. So thank you so much to all these individuals. Um, here are my references if any of you guys are interested in checking them out. And of course, again, thank you so much. And um, Aaron, if you'd like to introduce our next speakers next month. Um.